Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. We'll, we'll give it a minute or a minute and a half to have everyone settle down and then we will start. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another India and the World webinar hosted by Carnegie India. We are here today to discuss uh, Ambassador Vijay Gokhale's new paper, India's Fog of Misunderstanding Surrounding Nepal-China Relations. In this insightful pa paper, uh, Mr. Gokhale looks at the impact that New Delhi's misperceptions of Sino-Nepali relations, which he terms the fog of misunderstanding, what uh, this has, uh, the kind of effect this has had in the context of the triangular relations between India, Nepal, and China. Now, the paper, paper begins with a deep historical context of Sino-Nepalese relations, uh, British India's policy towards Nepal, and India's uh, post-independence relationship with Nepal between 1955 and 2008. And in the final section of the paper, paper uh, he considers China's evolving role during Nepal's democratization phase post-2008 and examines India's options in the face of Beijing's changing objectives in Nepal. I'm delighted to post this panel with Ambassador Vijay Gokhale, Dr. Constantino Xavier, and Apeksha Shah. Uh, Ambassador Gokhale is a non-resident senior fellow at Carnegie India. He retired from the Indian Foreign Service in January 2020 after a diplomatic career that spanned 39 years. From January 2018 to January 2020, he served as the Foreign Secretary of India. Mr. Gokhale has served as India's High Commissioner to Malaysia, as Ambassador of India to Germany, and as Ambassador of India to uh, the People's Republic of China. He has served as head of the India Taipei Association, as well as worked in key positions in the East Asia Division in, at headquarters, including as the Joint Secretary for East Asia. He has worked extensively on matters relating to the Indo-Pacific region with a special emphasis on Chinese politics and diplomacy. Since his retirement from the Foreign Service, Mr. Gokhale has contributed opinion pieces to the New York Times, The Hindu, and the Indian Express. He has also come out with uh, two books at, uh, and two uh, working papers, including the paper that we are uh, discussing today. Uh, he has been extremely prolific and he is also a distinguished visiting faculty at the Rashtriya Raksha University in Gujarat. Apeksha Shah is an assistant professor at the Department of International Relations and Diplomacy, Tribhuvan University in Nepal. She holds a postgraduate degree in diplomacy and foreign policy from City University of London and a bachelor's degree in political science from Delhi University. Her main areas of research include diplomacy, foreign policy, geopolitics, and public policy. She has contributed to the department journal, which uh, while she is also a freelance editor for other publications. She was one of the distinguished Humphrey Fellows in 2020, under which she attended an extensive education course on leadership for the 21st century at Harvard Kennedy School. Previously, she was the opinion editor of the Kathmandu Post, a leading English daily. Uh, Dr. Constantino Xavier is a fellow in foreign policy and security studies at CSEP and a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institution. He leads the Sambad Initiative on Regional Connectivity, which examines India's political, security, and economic relations with the South Asian neighborhood. He was previously a fellow at Carnegie India, where his research focused on India's uh, foreign policy with emphasis on relations with its neighboring countries and South Asian regional security. Dr. Xavier's research has been published in various journals and books, including Asian Policy, the Oxford Handbook on Indian Foreign Policy, and the Rutledge Handbook of China-India Relations. He has taught and lectured at various universities, as well as at Indian training institutions, including the Lal Bahadur Shastri National Academy of Administration, the Foreign Service Institute, and the National Defense College. He holds a PhD in South Asian Studies from the Johns Hopkins University. It is uh, a great pleasure and an honor to have all of you with us uh, together today. And before we start, a few house rules uh, for all of you that are joining us either on Zoom or on uh, the various social media platforms where we are live streaming this. Uh, please uh, leave your comments or your questions in the comment boxes and in these live stream streaming platforms. You can also leave them at the Carnegie India page on uh, uh, various social media platforms like uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, or anywhere else. And we will pick them up and bring it to uh, our uh, panelists uh, today. 
with that let me get uh, get into the meat of the discussion mr gokhale let me start with you you know one of the most interesting things that i thought about while reading the paper is uh, in india when india's uh, policy elites or the indian government or even citizens talk about uh, one of india's closest neighbors nepal both geographically and historically closest ne neighbors nepal the assumption is that the relationship is completely bilateral and there is there is no other player in the equation which which as you have pointed out is an unrealistic expectation and has actually been uh, a, a blind spot in indian policy making now i start by asking you the highlights of your paper but also how does india move beyond this this very obvious uh, problem thank you deep uh, and thank you kanik india for publishing the paper and i am very grateful to both uh, apeksha shah and dr constantino zevia uh, for being the panelists writing this paper was an interesting journey for me uh, and it all began when i started doing research for my book uh, my second book the long game how the chinese negotiate with india uh, on the chapter relating to tibet nepal kept popping up uh, with increasing frequency and i began to realize that china and nepal had a relationship even before 1949 which was formalized by treaties and agreements and exchange of diplomatic missions and i felt that since china's influence in south asia is now expanding and it is therefore a growing subject of interest both at the academic level and at the diplomatic and political levels a study on china nepal relations in some detail might be helpful uh, one objective of course was to see whether chinese objectives and motivations uh, with respect to nepal had changed over time and really uh, my research uh, led me to tentatively at least to make three conclusions first uh, there are historical links uh, between china and nepal not just between nepal and tibet and therefore china was not as many presuppose an interloper uh, to the himalayan region after the establishment of the people's republic of china uh, second my sense was that china looked at nepal from a with a defensive mindset and from a security perspective uh, their real concern was protecting a vulnerable southwestern part of their frontier and uh, and their control over the possessions in tibet uh, and this uh, was the situation both before 1949 and after 1949 uh, and the third conclusion was that uh, 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 let me say also that i saw no clear evidence to suggest that china had territorial ambitions in nepal or even sought direct control over nepal Uh, the third conclusion of course was that after 2013 i detect a distinct change both in the objectives that in the chinese objectives uh, uh, with relation to nepal and also their posture and activities vis-a-vis -vis nepal uh, so long so far as nepal was concerned i detected a consistency in their approach uh, my sense was there was a survivalist mindset uh prithvi narayan shah had spoken of nepal as a yam between two big states and i guess he was hinting at how nepal can survive uh, when uh, squeezed between two major neighbors but i also felt there was a transactional approach in other words how do you use uh, the two neighbors you have uh, to get or to extract benefits from both uh, and the third of course was uh, and this was also based on my research that uh, china that nepal always wanted to control the trade the commercial activity between tibet slash china and india and that has been a central objective and these are all very understandable objectives but i wanted to see whether in the new circumstances when china is looking for strategic control over nepal whether there is any change in the nepali position and so that is really the thrust of my paper india nepal relations was a secondary uh, objective because i did uh, feel that if i didn't address this issue it might sort of leave the paper uh, uh, unfinished uh, but i readily admit i am not an expert on nepal nor do i have any great practical experience of dealing with india nepal relations uh, and therefore uh, uh, i am open to whatever criticism uh, is is made 
but I do feel that at the end of it, uh, the one observation I stand by is we don't seem to have been able to build a proper narrative or to establish a working template in our relations with Nepal. And I think if the paper also leads to some thinking in that regard, it would be good. Okay, uh, the cardinal sin of talking on Zoom and not unmuting yourself. Uh, Mr. Gokhale, one of the things that you mentioned, you know, uh, are, are the three factors that you talk about, the future of China, India, Nepal relations, as it were, that, that would be determined by these three factors. And you say whether China sees its relations with uh, Nepal as a zero sum game game vis-a-vis uh, -vis India, whether Nepal recognizes the new situation and can adapt and whether India has the capacity to structurally calibrate relations with Nepal, right? right? And, and essentially, it all boils down to these three points, right? Yes. Realistically speaking, and this is a question that I will come to Apeksha and uh, Dr. Xavier as well with, uh, realistically speaking, where do you see the possibilities as far as these, these three points uh, stand as of today? So I uh, am quite convinced that China's whole uh, strategy towards Nepal has changed. Uh, and that is because as it moves to establish itself as the regional hegemon, uh, it is focusing more and more of its energies uh, in obtaining strategic control of its periphery and its proximate areas. And Nepal, of course, is not just a peripheral and proximate state. It is also the state which is uh, 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 flush on uh, the Tibet autonomous region which China sees as its vulnerable underbelly. Uh, and we can see Chinese efforts to build strategic control in Nepal taking place from right from their much greater involvement in politics, as we have seen in the last two years, uh, including the, the activities of the Chinese ambassador and the Chinese Communist Party in Nepal, all the way through to, to the cultural and educational field. Uh, so far as uh, Nepal is concerned, uh, I think that uh, they see a great opportunity in this because they feel that China's financial and developmental capabilities now actually allows them to build uh, the connectivity which they believe will help them benefit from what they expect will be growing India-China trade overland. Uh, but I feel that one area in which they have not focused is that the increasing competition between India and China uh, is, should be a matter of concern. And it should also be a matter of concern that if they exacerbate it or if they add to that competition, then in a sense, uh, they might be closing out the option of leveraging their relationship with both for the benefit of Nepal. So far as India is concerned, uh, my own sense is that uh, while there are people in India who bemoan the fact that uh, we are losing strategic space in Nepal and, and even in South Asia as a whole, uh, my submission is this deep, that in a globalized world, which country now has an exclusive backyard? In Latin America, which under the Monroe Doctrine was an American backyard, you have the Chinese and the Russians. Uh, in Eastern Europe, which was a, a, a Russian and subsequently Soviet backyard, you have the European Union and NATO. Uh, in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, you have China, the United States and Japan rubbing up against each other. And even the South Pacific, which Australia considered to be its own bailiwick, has Chinese presence growing there. So in a sense, instead of bemoaning the loss of strategic space, uh, our objective, I feel, India's objective, should be of how we maximize uh, the, uh, uh, our capacity to protect our strategic interests. And I think there are plenty of avenues for that. Uh, I suggest two or three options. Uh, one, of course, is we need to resolve a couple of longstanding issues, including the border issue. Secondly, we need to reach out to constituencies beyond the valley. Uh, uh, to a much wider group of people. Uh, third, we need to persist with development and uh, because connectivity is beneficial to us. Uh, but there are many other uh, suggestions and ideas and some of these uh, Constantino has covered in a number of articles on South Asia. So I think he would be uh, sort of 
well placed to answer the third question at least and in fact on that you know i could if i could come to you you know i mean these seem like very useful suggestions but one of the things that are highlighted uh, that is highlighted in in ambassador gokhale's paper is the is the fact that you you read it and you come out feeling that all these three players are undergoing changes in how they look at each other how they look at the region how they look at themselves and their place in the world right given that uh does do these problems the the border uh, issues between india and nepal or any any of the other issues do these issues seem like ones that could be resolved quickly i mean detractors would say that something that hasn't happened in 75 years when the world was dif- different right why would it happen now thank you deep uh, so good to see you and uh, thanks for hosting this and thanks to carnegie india um thanks uh, for this wonderful paper ambassador gokhale it's really um inspiring it's it's wonderful work and a quick note deep on why i really think this this paper is such an important contribution to to neighborhood studies in india and and our understanding of, of nepal i think it brings out first history right it starts in the 1700s in fact ambassador gokhale goes back to 17th century to look at the long durée of the history of different incarnations of the chinese state and different incarnations of the nepali state if you can simplify it in that sense um you know second value i think this paper is exactly what ambassador gokhale was highlighting now or at least emphasizing uh, it's not a paper necessarily about india it's also a paper about india it's also a paper about nepal but uh this is really about chinese materials and how the people's republic of china and its various avatars looks at nepal historically organizationally etc uh and third also you know i think it 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 does uh um towards the end in particular raise very important issues on in how india will have to adjust to those changes that you were mentioning right Chain, changes in china changes in nepal changes in india changes in the region and changes in the world a more interconnected world um i think those those are three very thing i think very important things uh that's uh, striking in this paper and i actually hope we can see similar papers coming out on sri lanka on bangladesh on the maldives on many of these countries right where the story is similar but not the same Uh, and I think no one better than Ambassador Gokhale, by the way, to, to write this. And I think this needs to be said because I think he's an expert in China. His uh, long game book on China is clearly mirrored here, and I think it's important for us to understand from someone that knows China as well as few people do in India uh, as Ambassador Gokhale how the Chinese think about Nepal. Right? Uh, that's uh, I think being quite an obscure field, and and we need to know more about that. Uh, of course, he's worked inside the Indian system, so Ambassador Gokhale knows all the. strengths and weaknesses also of the indian system and how india has looked at this perspective of uh, how, at this actor called china in nepal and finally it's it's scholarly work i mean it's i was counting it's 167 cited references for 25 pages so it's deeply referenced deeply cited and communicates with a lot of recent literature and scholarship coming out uh and that's i think much appreciated uh, two points just to get started with the first one is on i think I always like to start these discussions on and from the Indian perspective to complement a bit of Ambassador Gokhale's view on China and about you know I I think there's an eternal chimera and quest for control uh in regional powers it's an illusion right uh, for the reasons Ambassador Gokhale mentioned before but in general I mean historically even whether it was the US in Central America China towards East and Southeast Asia um so the Russia and the Caucasus even today region right these these are i think the illusion of proximity or what professor s d muni called the paradox of proximity i think often inculcates the the uh, the erroneous sort of idea that these are satellites that these are under control these are countries where you have tremendous power to shape developments which is an illusion really because history is made of actually of these difficulties of regional powers that constantly get entangled have difficulties in materializing the geographic proximity into actual political control influence and in making their core interests uh, realize or realizing their their core interests so i think that's the first caveat i just put in here on on the illusion of geography in that sense and in fact this being one of the most difficult relationships i think for any any indian diplomat or government official to deal with and that's why i think this is a fascinating laboratory 
these days. It's a live lab, with all due respect to calling the Palo Laboratory, but this whole region where, you know, we're seeing what you exactly mentioned, again, these changes happening, right? And it's in flux. And this is, makes it, I think, fascinating to look how states are adjusting their perspectives, but also their instruments to achieve their interests, right? And sometimes even redefining the interests. I think there's sort of continuity there, but it's more about the instruments and the perspective and the priority of different instruments. For example, security and political instruments versus economic connectivity, infrastructure, interdependence instruments. I think the latter has become much more important in India's perspective today than it was 50 years ago. Uh, the second point um, I think is on this, let me just come out with the, the, I think the biggest point to take away I take from this paper is that you know, this Indian fog of misunderstanding that Ambassador Vogel, I think, rightly uh, identifies that China somehow is an extra regional power, right? That China is interloping, that China is uh, being unreasonable by attempting to be more present in Nepal, which is what he argues a historical. And I think I agree with him from the 1700s to 1911, the paper beautifully lays out uh, as Amish Mumi's book recently, for example, does, the deep interconnected history between the region, state of Nepal, and the region and the state of China, right? And its various sort of incarnations. And there's, there's I think, more and more we can learn from that deep history. Where I'm uh, not so sure, um, or at least why I take a bit of a, a difference uh, from the paper, is that I see the great hundred years from 1911 uh, to 2013, 14, as I think um, an example where China actually was not very much present in Nepal. So in a sense, you know, the 1950s, which Ambassador, I think, uh, Google mentions in, in the second chapter, the 50s, uh, the second part of his paper. Yes, China shows up and reconstitutes the relationship, but with very limited interests, right? It's the border, it's the Tibet issue, it's the basic core territorial uh, uh, integrity issues, and then pretty much stays away, 1960s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s. Uh, in, it, it shows up occasionally and, you know, tries to, to push certain interests, but overall as, as, a, as a real actor in the sense of a strategic actor that shapes the events, shapes the ec economy of Nepal, for example, which it didn't, right? India shaped the economy of Nepal until it opened up in 91. Post 78, there are some attempts from the Chinese, but not really serious to affect the social, political, and economic reality in Nepal. So, and therefore, I my point is 2015 or 14 is the real tipping point. And therefore, I'm not so sure there was a fog of misunderstanding on the Indian perspective that you know there was somehow, you know, India was unable to see China in Nepal because China, my view is simplistic, that China was not really res a resident actor in Nepal. So I actually think that the problem was rather than the fog uh, hindering India's sort of view of Nepal, the Chinese fog, I think actually the, vis the visibility was extremely clear. And that was a problem for India. India had a clear road in Nepal, it could afford, it had tremendous capacity to do whatever it wanted in Nepal for large parts of, the, of that period, from 1950s to, in fact, from the 1910s, 20s, the British uh, uh, system and then the Indian independence system post 47. And that visibility, that, that clear visibility is no longer there. So my proposition is that fog is actually showing up over the last five, 10 years now. And it's forcing India to change its navigational instruments, rethink its roads to Nepal, rethink its view. But um, I, I'm just not so sure that um, uh, there was so much of an obsession about China uh, in, in the Indian system from the 50s onwards. Uh, there were concerns, but it was really not an uh, effective um, actor in Nepal uh, that should have worried uh, India. That's, that's a really interesting point, you know, and Apeksha, if I can, if I can bring you in here, you know, I mean, uh, you, you're sitting in Kathmandu, and, and it's important to ask you here about, uh, about, about this period of time that Mr. Gokhil has written about, or Tina was talking about the last century, uh, how, how Nepal has, uh, uh, the role that China has played in Nepal, how Nepal has seen China. 
and the changes that have come about eight or 10 years ago, right? Uh, both, towards, uh, both towards Nepal's understanding and perception of Chinese, China's role in their, in, their, in their relationship, as well as India's. Right, thank you so much, Deep. Uh, and good evening, everyone. Um, I would like to uh, extend my gratitude to Carnegie India for having me over. Uh, and it's a great privilege to be able to participate today. And um, the paper is very timely uh, and successfully summarizes the present uh, changes taking place in the trilateral relations between India, Nepal, and China and uh, possible future trajectories that this could lead to. Uh, I think the division of the paper in different timelines really helps uh, to put the perspective out there as to the complications of the scenario. And uh, right, and I think Mr. Gokhale gets to the crux of the matter, uh, you know, sort of, you know, when he implies that independent India did not take an adequate appreciation of Kathmandu's history with China while devising its Nepal policy in the initial years. And I think that is a, that, that's a very correct reading because it's very important to understand Nepal's uh, psychic as uh, in response to its sovereign status uh, during the colonization period. And the fact that Nepal's foreign policy sort of extends from that period, not from 1945 uh, or not from 1947 or from 1950, it, was, it, it changes, but it has a historical baggage and a historical um, understanding of its place in the region and between its uh, actors, as already mentioned by our speakers. And I think that is a, a very crucial uh, thing to begin with. Uh, and when we talk about uh, you know, China's role increasing in recent years, I think, again, a, a bit of respect, a, a bit of uh, you know, uh, reflection is required, I think, which uh, uh, Mr. Gokhale has done wonderfully, uh, where he talks about this historical perspective of China-Nepal relations. And I think uh, things really changed for the modern day, uh, these three countries uh, when uh, when the annexation of Tibet happened and when India recognized Tibet uh, without settling its border issues. And that is actually, I would say that was the time actually when Nepal sort of enters into an actual, uh, you know, a boulder between a stone kind of a situation. Because before that, it was sort of like a protectorate of the uh, British. So it was, it was mostly a semi-buffer at most. Uh, but then, yeah, I think that that really changed the reality. And uh, then again, the changes that was taking place inside Nepal, that of course, definitely have a lot of repercussion. But I think what we need to recognize, so uh, let me break it down in three uh, sections too, so that it, it sounds, uh, it's more magical. Manageable. So right. So when we talk about post uh, 1955, um, uh, despite uh, you know India directly supporting uh, the King Mahendra's father to come into power and supporting democratic forces to come into power, there were reservations about the special relationship that India had secured with the discredited Rana regime. Now the Treaty of 1950 became a bone of contention uh, within both the specters in Nepal, the palace and the democratic forces. Well, it did not take long before the king uh, overtook uh, the power. And at that time, it is uh, interesting to note that, uh, you know, that was a time when we see this um, fog of misunderstanding, I think, or however we would like to put it, but this, this, uh, this difference of opinion when it came to the special relationship, right? So during Panchayat, I think King Mahindra wanted to sort of uh, move away from the Indian cloud and he did sort of pursue diversify his uh, diplomatic relations of Nepal and so did his pre uh, pre uh, predecessor uh, King Brindra uh, and, and and during that time uh, of course one was to open up relations uh, with uh, foreign powers a, 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 a policy that the Ranas had already started actually uh, like you know trying to take membership to the UN. So diversification of diplomatic practices, although it should be credit to Mahindra, it sort of was a, it was already a policy that was already there uh, before Mahindra came into power. But of course, the, the, the biggest change at the time was when King Mahindra and during the Panchayat regime basically wanted to create a more st uh, strengthening relationship with China. And that is the time I think we see this uh, difference between the two countries that, uh, you know, when it could have been the road from, you know, Lhasa to Kathmandu. And, and this is happening at the time, like Tino has mentioned, that China was not even present, the fog was very clear, the Indian influence uh, was, quite, uh, was, was quite clear at that time to a certain extent. But then as Nepal wanted to open up its relationship with China, and as the strengthening of uh, Nepal-China ties was uh, really seen as, uh, from India, it was seen as it was a breach of the special relationship. And I think this is where the two countries sort of started to sort of depart. While, you know, Nepal wanted to sort of 
exercise its sovereign right of being an independent country and wanting to continue its foreign policy. India's reaction to China, I think, uh, played into the hands of policymakers in Kathmandu and China card sort of emerged because of these Indian insecurities relating to uh, Nepal, uh, China ties. And, and, it, and it, it depends if that was something that should have been there or not. However, the nail in the coffin was 1989 when uh, Nepal bought uh, weapons from China, which was again seen as a breach of the special relationship. But at the time, I think that was, that was something that was very clear that uh, India did not want to see Nepal being too close to China, and that hurts Indian sensitivities, and they accuse Kathmandu of playing the Chinese card. And I think that was one phase, one historical uh, phase uh, that sort of set the tone. And then after that, I think the phase from 1996 to, let's say, 2014-15, there was unparalleled Indian cloud in Nepal. There is no denying to that, uh, given the vulnerabilities uh, within, uh, you know, within India's domestic uh, scenario. Uh, there was uh, this, uh, this, you know, there was this space created uh, for India. And I think during this period, there were mainly three points, which again sort of reflects uh, Indians, uh, Indian policy in Nepal as well as in the region. So the first was, of course, uh, the points relating to China, uh, even during 1996 to 2000, 2015, we can see. Uh, it was, you know, Nepal China ties were seen as uh, from a very, uh, very skeptic point of view from the Indian establishment. And the second thing that they were really uh, able to secure was uh, the involvement of the international actors in Nepal civil war and during the peace process. They successfully, uh, you know, India successfully negotiated with the Western powers to not get involved in the country. Uh, they were very suspicious of the UN men. And so this is another reflection of the Indian policy that we, you know, I think that does not come much about is that, uh, and something again related to Indira Gandhi and and uh, Rajiv Gandhi's uh, doctrine of not wanting external powers uh, inside the region. And like the, the previous speakers have mentioned, that is something that might not work uh, in today's time, or it, it, I don't think it worked even earlier. Uh, I think India's positioning just made it easier for Nepal to play a Chinese card. So these are the two policies I think that sort of brought the Chinese card up. But I think the other thing that really worked to India's detriment uh, was its involvement uh, in the as a mediator between the political parties, the Maoists and the palace. And I think during that phase, I think we've got very extensive recording of that. I think Sudhir Sharma has written a wonderful book called The Nepal Nexus, which covers that period uh, that shows uh, more complexities uh, of, you know, getting involved and the entire process sort of backfired and India's heavy handedness has been seen. There were many voices coming out of Delhi. Every, you know, the Nepali writer admits it. Uh, I think the Indian side has also admitted there was confusion. There were more than actors. There were more. There were more actors uh, getting involved in Nepal policy within India, also, which is again another very uh, important phase that Nepal needs to sort of look into to understand its diplomatic practices and the um, effect of uh, you know having to deal with large neighbors. So I think that really played into. Uh, in, you know, it did not work in the favor of uh, India. Then again, 2015 and 2020 became like. The same thing, very same. If you guys look at the statement, it's very same. Playing the India card, you know, accusing Nepal that such games are not going to go far. And then, yeah, and then India and then in, in, in Nepal sort of started off with agreements with China. That was again, you know, again, accused of uh, Nepal wanting to play the two uh, players off each other. And I, I think that again brought, and then the whole blockade, and that again brought out this memory in this young generation about India's hegemonic behavior, which, which I think is becoming very difficult. And all of this time, um, China was merely a spectator, you know, it helped the establishment, its uh, contacts were limited to the palace, uh, it was seen like an amicable neighbor that does not get too involved in uh, Nepal's internal affairs, and in the meantime, India's interactions were seen as, uh, you know, were not were not very positively viewed. So I think that is why I think China sort of gets an advantage because there's not much interaction between the two actors. And now that as we move for as we move forward from post 2015, where the interaction between Nepal and China is increasing, I think there will I think Nepal will have more things to consider as uh, we move ahead. And 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 I think uh, I think Nepal believes uh, you know traditionally 
Chinese policy was to obtain Nepal's uh, cooperation in, uh, you know, not letting the Tibetan rebels and external powers use its territory for anti-Chinese uh, activities and to obtain Nepal's commitment to neutrality or even acceptance to the one China policy. So I think that has been the belief that was the policy that Chinese have taken in the past as the two countries move forward. It will depend if the relationship is going to work on the basis of Ponchi, which uh, the two countries sort of say, and which has highly influenced Nepal's uh, foreign policy uh, during Panchayat. And I think it will sort of will influence in the days ahead as well. Right. So I think I would like to stick here and then maybe I'll get back to you guys later. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, okay, in fact, I, just to follow up to, to what you said, you know, one of the things that Mr. Gokhale says is, is, is he, he talks about this blind spot, right? Inability to see China in, in, in the India-Nepal relationship, right? Or China's role in, in Nepal, right? Uh, in a post-2008 or a post-2015 kind of a scenario where uh, the political elites have, have multiplied, where, where political power has, uh, you know, uh, separated and divided among so many more constituents, right? Is, is just understanding Nepal's role enough or are there so many other pulls and pushes that are at play? Uh, uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, honestly, like, see, we, Nepal is in the receiving end. The vulnerabilities have, the vulnerabilities have increased. The 2015 blockage showed how it depended Nepal's economy is on imports. And, you know, even with, and Nepal knows that decoupling, you know, we, we, it's not like, you know, India is talking about decoupling from China. Nepal wants to decouple from India to a certain extent. So, you know, uh, these are complicated issues. And we all know that. And Nepal is going to be in the receiving end. And, and like I said, I think, it takes interaction between countries to understand one another. There is so much of baggage in Nepal-India relations that does play to India's disadvantage while China gets, but then that's going to change, you know, that is going to change. And I think this is where, um, this is where India, I don't know, this is where they can play a role, like, you know, there has to be an understanding that there is no denying that the Chinese, uh, the rise of China, that it, let alone, like, you know, Nepal being a, immediate neighbor. We only have two neighbors. So that has to be put into consideration. And it's not only India, the American policy, the other geopolitical policies is going to put Nepal into a very, very sticky situation. And I think this is what Nepali policymakers are very concerned. I think it's, it's already become, uh, it has become very much of a concern in recent months, in few months itself, with uh, so many things uh, coming out. So I think, uh, I think, uh, I think uh, Mr. Gokhale, he again sums it up very nicely in the ending where he says a path to the fog, the future of triangular relationship uh, will look, uh, you know, and in that section, like, you know, he mentions how it's going to look different for each country, and each country's response is going to affect the reactions of others. Uh, but if New Delhi is unwilling to permit China a passage to India, or if China thinks that India is a threat to its security interests, Nepal may become a proxy battlefield by a bystander fought in the crosshair of vaulting regional ambitions. And this is a very stark reminder to Nepali foreign policy makers, because I think one of the thing about the Panchayat policy, that that people do not want to really talk about is this policy about diversification of Nepal's diplomatic practices, its contribution to UN, its, its presence in non-alignment movement. Uh, and this, and, and again, talking about the British era, that you know, the Britishers did have a direct contact with the British crown back in 1935 because they wanted to evade the British bureaucracy. They knew that independent India was, was going to change the scene and it took them so long because the British bureaucracy was enjoying so much of leverage over Nepal at that time. So, you know, so I think it, it has been mentioned that playing the two neighbors off was not the only policy that Nepal has taken in the past when complexities have increased in the region. It has adopted, it, it did adopt a very vibrant foreign policy and and I think that is something that Nepali foreign policy makers will be looking into. They will be looking into past as well as the changing scenarios, because it's not a very typical Cold War scenario, is it? So I think that is definitely going to have an impact. Okay, I mean, uh, thanks, thanks for that, Apex. And you know, if I can come to you, because uh, the conversation about China today in Nepal, it's very difficult to have that conversation without talking about the BRI, without talking about uh, uh, the role that a promise of connectivity and, and infrastructure projects does, does bring to, to Nepal, right? And you've done considerable amount of work on this. And what I want to understand is why at a political level, as a, as a, as a, as a discourse, at a discourse level, it is already fine and fair to talk about, you know, the alternatives that are available to Nepal uh, or from the Indian end, very often people talking about, you know, Nepal being 
a, 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 part, a, a partner or a participant in BRI and therefore kind of moving out of India's strategic ambit. But what I'm trying to understand is the feasibility of these of many of these projects, right? I mean, if we talk about the uh, about the Kerimbrasua rail link, right? I mean, we we know and there's been enough talk and enough writing about the technological difficulties, about the costs associated, and and it's it's not just a question of uh, building the rail link; it'll have to be maintained after that, right? And even that is going to be a very expensive affair, right? So so that's that's one. The other part is you know after 2015. One of the one of the aspects that have been talked about ad nauseum is the is the uh, protocol on on trade and transit, right? Uh, but again, in that, when you look at the distances, right? I mean, access to a dry port in in China is one thing, but but the distance between, let's say, uh, the one that one talks about most often is the comparison between Birganj and Tianjin and 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 uh, the port in Kolkata, right? Uh, so so when one looks at these aspects, you know. What I'm trying to understand, because you earlier talked about the various kinds of associations. On one side is the political and security aspect of the relationship. On the other is the economic, the connectivity, the infrastructure, the, the interdependence aspect of the relationship. Right? I'm trying to understand how feasible is that part, and if that part is un, uh, is is not as feasible as is being talked about, then does the relationship again turn largely towards a political relationship? Because we have seen. Uh, and as Mr. Gokhale mentions in his paper, we have seen a lot of interest from the Chinese Communist Party uh, uh, towards engaging political players in Nepal. We have seen the ambassador active in Nepal during during the uh, crisis in the Communist Party last year. Uh, we have seen a number of uh, uh, joint political events being conducted and, and, and so on. Yeah, so Deep, you, you, I think you, on this connectivity issue, uh, and the mindset change that is coming with it on both sides, by the way, on China too. I think it's exactly, we all agree that there is a new China out there in Nepal now. Uh, I was just reminded, I, mean, I just tweeted it a few minutes ago, and uh, you know, Prime Minister Nehru in 1950, standing in front of the Indian parliament saying, even a child knows that to go to Nepal, you have to come through India, right? There's no other way. Those were the geographic, geoeconomic circumstances in the 1950s, not the 1920s, not in the 1800s, like we know. I think that we, but there is an interruption of that post 1910s, 20s. There's a distance, slowly distanciation via first Tibet, a more autonomous, independent Tibet, but also through a geoeconomic partition of these two regions. That's, I think, the light motif of those hundred years, I at least argue, that yes, there were concerns in the EU system, but let's examine quickly. Uh, to what extent China really showed up or not. And I think Ambassador Mukule makes this point that it was actually Nepal that tried to play off in the China card, but wouldn't actually get much of a response. You know, uh, MP Koirala, IT Singh, TP Acharya, BP Koirala, all leaders in the 1950s, all get sent back to Nepal when they ask for critical support from the People's Republic of China in the 1950s and various crises, I'll spare the details. King Mahendra in the 1960s, post-62 war, India and China are states at war, enemy states. He goes to Beijing, but he's also politely told, you know, there's very little we can do for you. And relationships remain frozen. 1979, students uprising and the first political crisis under Birinder. Again, China comes out very badly in the picture. 1989, yes, China stood up, but China played it up only up to the point of then ditching King Birinder. And that's the memory that is actually left on the, on the, on the Nepali psyche, strategic psyche, that there was a promise of some support, but the moment the heat intensified, China looked the other way and redirected Kathmandu towards New Delhi. 2000 and, uh, 2005, King Yanendra, again, right, plays the China card strongly, naturally, good realism, strategy balancing, but you know, the regime collapses and it's the end of a hundreds of years old monarchy, it's the end of a regime not because of India's fault, domestic crises, lack of Chinese support, and then Indian midwifing, supporting a, stability, a new a transition towards a new regime. Finally, even Prachanda, 2008, he's told very politely, you know, never forget that, you know, you, you, a tiger doesn't have space for two, a mountain, a mountain top doesn't have space for two tigers. India and China, we both have interests, you're there, but, you know, for the time being, we can't do too much. That has changed or slowly changing on the last few years. So that, that's my point about, you know, India actually having yet gotten lazy, if I may say so. And I, I think more than the fog is there was clear visibility. It was, it was an easy game. 
and you used instruments that allowed you to implement your interests more or less. Um, but that visibility is much less today. There is actually the fog is coming out now, right? And that's creating a certain tension in the Indian system. How do we deal with this new reality, this new China, this really present China now? And I think that's therefore, you know, a challenge. You, you're driving in the fog. What do you do? You have to change your maps, your navigational instruments. You have to join a caravan of different cars, maybe work with others to drive through the fog. Um, so tilting at windmills, I think there was no windmill really, you were tilting, but now, now there may be, it's not that they're not, that they're not uh, adversaries out there, but India will have to drive through the fog, and that's actually the greatest favor Chinese presence through that connectivity in those last five to ten years has done for India. The biggest driver of India-Nepal relations today is China, and what China has done for Nepal, what China has been doing in Nepal and across the region over the five, last five, six years. It's shaken the Indian system. It's made India produce, deliver more than it has had since the 1950s, not ever before, but 1950s. The last time the Indian state invested massively in the infrastructure, the modernization, the institutional reforms, military reforms, uh, administrative reforms, electoral political reforms, infrastructure and economic assistance was the 1950s, 60s. The results go to the 1960s. I was last year in Janakpur. Uh, in southern Nepal. The airport was built in 1967. I mean, today it's little more than a small, there's, there's, there's a cl medical clinics that have bigger reception halls than that airport. And now the new one has just been inaugurated, right? So I think now you really, I think India is trying to do that. And the paradox is that demands from Nepal are much higher, right? The country is modernizing. It's a young population. Foreign policy has become politicized. It's competitive multi-party politics. There are many more actors. It's a competitive marketplace, right? You have, forget only Chinese, you have the Americans, you have the Europeans, you have the Japanese doing phenomenal work in those countries, right? So that is, I think, actually a good development because it's forcing India now to focus, concentrate, and trying to navigate this fog, right, in a more competitive way. The last point I think I'll make is on, I think what Ambassador, Men uh, Ambassador Gokhale rightly warns us about uh, the danger of uh, excessive geopolitical rivalries in, in Nepal. And I think he speaks in page 21 about, I quote, Nepal may become a proxy battlefield, a bystander caught in the crosshairs of vaulting, of vaulting regional ambitions and, co and competitions, end quote. So reminding me of Foreign Minister of Nepal, Rishi Keshaha, in 1962, and I quote the Foreign Minister of Nepal in 1962, saying, our security and freedom of Nepal depend to a large extent on the performance of cordiality between India and China. Now, I'm not sure to what extent that is appreciated today in Nepal. I think some segments in the Nepali policymaking circles realize that they have an interest in cordial relations between India and China. But there's also the temptation, right? And there I would just take a slight difference from, from what uh, Apechua you saying about, you know, we at the receiving end. You know, there's been also a strong Nepali tradition and we see it flare up occasionally of using its agency and its location to you know, instigate, and I'll use that word, certain competition and conflict sometimes, or at least below conflict for the threshold, below the threshold of conflict, competition between India and China. And that is a dangerous game, and I think that, that can also affect Nepal and its future stability and developmental path. Right. Thank, thanks for that, Tino. And, and uh, uh, those, those who are viewing us on Zoom or on YouTube or on various other social media platforms, please uh, drop your questions in the comment boxes. And, and we will take them from there. But before we go off the questions, uh, Mr. Gokhale, I wanted to come to you. Um, Tino talked about, uh, uh, he started with, with uh, Prime Minister Nehru's quote. There's a, there's a quote from him that, that features very prominently in the paper as well. And you also talk about you know, uh, India being undecided between the monarchy and democratic forces in Nepal, whereas China very early on and very quickly, steadfastly, supported the monarchy and, and that, that helped them till, till uh, 2008. But while, I mean, we, we understand the question of the, the while, while, we are, while we do talk about, the, about Chinese foreign policy being far more pragmatic, isn't one part of this also uh, the, the, the early expectation or the early uh, attempt 
on India's part to, to in a way, um, export the democratic values that, that it held or it, it uh, uh, held uh, close to itself when it was emerging as a state. And those values or, or those, those paths that were taken early on after independence, after Indian independence, continuing through policy even later. The, uh, first of all, I think both uh, uh, Constantino's and the Piksha's comments are very helpful because uh, I entirely agree with uh, Tino when he says that, the, that, that there was very clear visibility about what China was doing all the way up to 2010. Uh, I have no difference of opinion at all on that. My uh, intention, I think uh, perhaps our own spectacles had formed up. And, uh, 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 but I do take, uh, uh, I have a slight difference with uh, Tino as to the situation after 2010. I think in fact that the, that, that fog, defogging process is taking place. And uh, 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 I think we are being forced as uh, uh, Tino said to change because China is now uh, present in the region. Um, Apeksha's view was also very helpful because it was the perspective from the other side. And I think that's always helpful in balancing uh, whatever writings we do because I mean, I think and write like an Indian. Uh, as far as your question is concerned, Deep, I think the, uh, uh, I mean, the critical point is that in the uh, 1950s and 60s, uh, I, we were influenced, I, I think India assumed um, a larger role than simply being a democratic state in South Asia. Uh, perhaps there were our reasons to also believe that we assumed the mantle of, uh, the, of the largest player in the region from the British Empire. Uh, and therefore, uh, um, uh, our efforts to uh, um, sort of bring democracy to Nepal had a slightly paternalistic approach, if I might say so. Um, now, uh, I think over time that has certainly changed. Um, uh, in the first place, I think India has, it tends less to now uh, sort of talk about uh, being the mother of democracies in the region. Um, Secondly, I think we uh, uh, do understand uh, that, uh, uh, that democracy in Nepal has brought its own set of complications and that there are several political parties there. Uh, thirdly, I think that uh, for us, uh, the issue is no longer bringing democracy to Nepal, but using that democracy to build a new relationship with India. And uh, there I uh, feel that uh, we uh, can take a number of steps uh, to use that democracy for that purpose. Uh, a democratic setup in Nepal allows us to reach beyond the Kathmandu Valley and the Nevadi community to other parts of Nepal. It allows us to use uh, uh, pol legitimate political means uh, to uh, talk about Indian interests, Indian red lines, to understand Nepali interests and Nepali red lines. And thirdly, I think we actually can, I mean, uh, my sense is that China prefers to deal with non-democratic regimes, with authoritarian regimes. And it is investing in the Nepal Communist Party or parties. And conversely, that means it might harm the interests of the democratic forces in Nepal. India's position is much more flexible. We are prepared to deal with all forces in Nepal, communist, non-communist, uh, whether they are formal political groups or informal political arrangements. And I think, therefore, in the long run, this gives us a greater play than it does to China. Uh, but I think that the bottom line is what uh, Constantino uh, mentions and again and again, and I completely agree with him. Uh, I wouldn't use the word lazy when it comes to Indian policy for obvious reasons, but I would certainly say that perhaps we were complacent uh, because we felt there was no challenge. That situation has fundamentally changed. Uh, the question is whether we can, uh, I think we believe we need to shake off the complacency. The question is whether we can shake it off in a manner which actually creates a new working template or not. All right, I'm, I'm glad Ambassador Gokhale that you brought it to, to uh, you. the last part of your answer kind of moved away from the history to the present because uh, we have some questions coming in and uh, irrespective of how much we like talking about historical relations between India and Nepal and China's role in it, these questions deal with 
far more recent events. And uh, the first one is, is uh, about a colleague at the uh, Chingyao Carnegie Global Policy Center who wants to know about uh, the, what, what role uh, the Nepal's uh, Millennium Compact Challenge acceptance in the parliament might take uh, an Indian view on that. But at the same time, I'm curious about how it is being looked at at the other end. Uh, and Apeksha can help us with that. And uh, from an infrastructure point of view, maybe Tino might have thoughts on that as well. Uh, we'll start with you, uh, Mr. Gokhale. So let me be very brief. I think there is a concerted effort by the Chinese side to misrepresent the MCC. Uh, it is developmental assistance by the United States to Nepal. Like all development assistance, uh, there are self, there is self-interest involved. But to my mind, there is nothing in the MCC which suggests that the objective of the MCC is eventually to subvert the Nepali state or in some way to, for the Americans to use the Nepali territory uh, to subvert the People's Republic of China. Apeksha? Right. Uh, yeah. So I think, yeah, that's uh, MCC. Uh, this is what I was talking about. Like, I agree with Tino to a great extent. Uh, the fact that, you know, the mutual beneficial economic uh, relation we wanted with India did not deliver. And that's why the complexity, whatever laziness, whatever you guys like to put it, that might have played out. Uh, but then again, that, yeah, that we are going to benefit. And we do see our geostrategic position as our leverage and, uh, you know, to do, you know, to, to derive power or to, you know, to, to, present and that does play into our advantage it does and it has in the past but that again complicates and this is what happened with the mcc also the larger uh, geopolitical uh, repercussions and for nepal to having to choose a side uh, against its neighbors is going to be tricky and we're going to see that in days ahead there was a lot of misinformation and disinformation that played out in the mcc fiasco because this was an agreement negotiated long before indo-pacific strategy was endorsed the agreement is airtight. If you look into it, there's not much controversies as much as it was created. And this is another thing. It is not only the new democratizing, it's not only the new political parties that have come up. It's these new mediums of social media and media. We saw this playing out between Nepal and India. Uh, first time in history, there was anti-Nepal sentiments in India, you know, because of the uh, media coverage that sort of followed after the Kalapani issue. So I think these, you know, this democratization, this the, the foreign policy environment is becoming very complex. And this is what I was trying to say is going to play into Nepal's disadvantage is because there are so many vulnerability, politicization, the political stability looks very far, you know, the Nepali people have started to question who represents us, have Nepali people been represented till today, like, you know, these are questions that even Nepal needs to raise with, you know, Nepali people have been raising with their government. And then comes the situation where the international actors have been supporting these governments to stay in power in Nepal. So it is, it's such a complex place. And, uh, but yeah, I think MCC compact of the Prime Minister has said that it will pass through and, you know, if it doesn't, then, you know, and, but I think this is a reflection of where the, the, the complex, you know, the complexities in diplomatic practices for Nepal is going to come. Uh, and yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think I would like to just end with that. Okay, you know, I'll come to you in a second, but uh, Apeksha, you know, I mean, if I can, if I can stretch that out a little more to understand it a little better, you know, uh, uh, said that before, you know, you, you said that again about, about how, with the new technologies, with the various constituents, it's become so much more different. Discourse has become so much more, it moves so at a faster rate, it distorts at a faster pace, right? Um, what, what kind of a role can the elites play in, in, um, in trying to iron out and bring about a situation where uh, the discourse does not get distorted in, in these ways? Because, I mean, we know that all, all, all constituents have tried to use the discourse to their advantage, right? And, and this is possibly the flip side of that. So this, right, so this is again what I've been talking about. Like, you know, the diplomatic history that we share with India has set so many precedents that now it's very easy for other people to cross the line. And now I don't know who should I be blaming this for, but the lapse of judgment when it came to diplomacy, may it be Nepali side or may it be in the Indian side, has set a precedent, which, which makes it very difficult for our policymakers to be able to, you know, the temptation of not politicizing the issue. All the political parties want to have their own foreign policy. They all have, which is very unheard of, if we look into academic perspective, 
political parties cannot have foreign policy. Countries can have foreign policy, but there's this, this fascination with IR. This fasc Again, a, a very temptation. I think everybody needs to be a phase where everybody needs to stop getting tempted by the past policies. India has to find out a new way to deal with Nepali elites. Nepali elites have to sort of move away from trying to politicize the issue because it's just going to create more problem. And I think this is where I think Nepali elites will be investing more. Political stability, of course, number one. And then, of course, a united front in uh, in foreign policy. And it was so interesting. The, yesterday, I had a conversation with somebody and then she brought this point up that, yeah, it's the only foreign ministry that does not get foreign support. And I, and I laughed. And I was like, yeah, because, you know, all of our other ministries have got such extensional support from donors and Nepal's economy is because of remittance and the donor based, uh, you know, foreign aid that comes through our donors. And and yeah, and I think, you know, lack of resources, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult for the foreign ministry. It has been difficult for our elites to come up with a comprehensive policy. And these are the challenges I think Nepal will have to look into. And I think they are looking into it. Um, it's, and it's getting very complicated because like, like, you know, China was not there. Now China is there. Now it's like, you know, well, China is approaching your board or how come you're not taking the issue with China? Like, you know, how come MCC talks against uh, China? So, you know, so there's so many, uh, you know, this balance, neutral policy is not going to be an easy feat for anybody here. And uh, yeah, but I think uh, the foreign policymakers in Nepal in days to come have a lot of uh, the tasks cut out for them uh, to, you know, in days ahead for sure. You know, uh, if I can come back to the question of uh, MCC yeah. infrastructure and politicization and where the countries fit in. Yeah, on, on uh, just on the connectivity and complacency, and I think we have to acknowledge, I think uh, Ambassador Gokar is being humble because he played a very important role in this as foreign secretary. But over the last few years, we've seen phenomenal progress in connectivity, right? That for me, as you know, has been uh, the uh, uh, baseline on which I judge the future of Indian-Nepal relations. It's not who's in government in Kathmandu or if India's playing games about supporting one group or the other or even doing good, good work at cobbling together coalition, bringing up stability. I'm not saying that is unnecessary. India has its interests and must do what powers do. It has its interests and has its political interests and has its preferences. But if you look at rail connectivity, petroleum products pipeline, Integrated check posts. I mean, I have to say some of these border crossings between India and Nepal, we say it's an open border, but it's if open means mobility and fluidity, it's not open by any standard until 10 years ago, right? I mean, literally uh, seven days for a truck to cross, right? Now we're down to three days. Uh, uh, power linkages, Arun and the Koshi projects, finally taking off after decades of planning and delays. Uh, paper-based trade towards electronic cargo tracking system, right? Nepal hit record levels of exports last year in the pandemic year, mostly because of these new trade facilitation mechanisms and port access that India has been facilitating. Air linkages, Nepal was asking for more air slots for years. Finally, the negotiations are going ahead. Inland waterways to be used as commercial arteries between Nepal and India. Uh, reaching out to new constituencies in Nepal beyond, you know, with all due respect, the older generations of politicians, you know, an active public diplomacy outreach from India to a variety of constituencies, provincial constituencies in the Madesh in particular, but also different groups in Kathmandu. I think all of that is happening. And that's, I think, already therefore that mindset change has already happened. I think on certain issues, you still see tensions within the system. And I'd say India doesn't have one Nepal policy. It has many trends and many currents. And sometimes they clash. Sometimes they converge, as in all states. But that's the first interesting point I'd like to make on connectivity and on the sort of uh, complacency towards more activist foreign policy and a different type of foreign policy from a political one to more economic interdependence. Second one, democracy, deep, a very good question because I think um, India has invested tremendously in democracy in Nepal from the 1950s. And that's not only, again, political regime and government formation, it means capacity building, technical assistance, thousands of Nepalis trained in India, on variety of functional issues, education, water, energy, uh, parliamentary procedures, elections, right? I think that needs to be acknowledged. That is an investment in it. It's not out of luxury or out of enthusiasm for a more democratic Nepal, nor by the way, the sort of conspiracy theory that India has an interest in a weak democratic Nepal and the monarchy gave you know, a blissful centralized control over Nepal. Uh, India does this because I think Ambassador Shamsaran put it in the best way, I think in a speech in 2005, India wants a stable Nepal and in principle in general, it sees that stability 
as a function of a more democratic Nepal, a federal Nepal, an inclusive Nepal, and therefore an uneasiness also with the Communist Party of Nepal recently, which is, you know, a unique concentration of power. And I think we all agree now has actually uh, uh, led to tremendous governance problems over the last few years. And that leads me to the last point, which is the MCC. You know, I think there is traditionally, as Nepal had very little agency, I think in the past decades, subject to a lot of Indian predominant uh, influence there often interiorized this idea of victimization, we're just a puppet, we're thrown around, et cetera. And I still hear that sometimes. But here's a case on the MCC that is about power and electricity. I mean, there's nothing more apolitical than that. There's something strategic to it, obviously, but it is important for the development of Nepal. It's part of Nepal's modernization plan. It's part of Nepal's ambition to become a, 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 a low middle income country in two, three years. And still you had the politicians playing games and no one really able to bless this agreement of the United States with Nepal. And also pushing this, you know, in a political sense. So yes, see a huge gap, which is normal, all democratic transitions, by the way, which Nepal is going through, India is still going through all, all these countries, but Nepal in a more quick, fast way over the last 15 years, which is the, polit the political establishment. I think a picture you mentioned that the next generation people like a picture and also policymakers and bureaucrats that have been warning the political establishment, you know, stop playing these big geostrategic games because it's actually hindering Nepal's developmental imperatives. In, in the case of the MCC, I think that's the most, uh, uh, it's, it's, the, it's the most acute example of this politicization of policy, of foreign policy in particular. All right, thanks for that, Dino. Uh, another question, Mr. Gokula, this time for you, uh, where earlier we were talking about, you know, in a globalized world, uh, maintaining one's sphere of influence is, is more and more difficult, right? And, and a viewer basically is asking about uh, the fact that as the world becomes uh, multipolar, right, isn't there a greater attempt to, to create and maintain these spheres of influence? And if so, uh, what does this mean for, for this, uh, this particular triangle that we are talking about today? Yeah, well, Deep, I think it's, it is, I think, axiomatic that uh, countries which uh, uh, consider themselves to be regionally influential or globally influential do build constituencies in other countries, particularly in those proximate to them. Uh, this is not unique to India. But I think the, the point that all three of us have made is that post 2008, when the monarchy fell and more importantly, post 2015, there is more than one player. And therefore, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the question is not of maintaining an exclusive relationship with Nepal any longer, but of ensuring that your strategic space and your key interests are preserved uh, while accepting the fact that Nepal is going to have uh, a bigger relationship, not only with China, but possibly also with the United States and other countries. Um, and we see this in the readiness with which Nepal has joined uh, a so-called quadrilateral meeting with China, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and so on. Uh, the, uh, 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 my point, however, is that I think in Nepal, there also needs to be some introspection, not just in India, about how this changing situation can benefit the both of us. Uh, playing the, 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 the India and China cards, to my mind, uh, and I think Apeksha made this point, is not, uh, uh, doesn't appear to be a viable policy anymore. But uh, I don't see any alternative policy emerging at the moment either. Uh, and uh, my, the last paragraph that I... Um, uh, 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 wrote in my papers, I think at the point I want to flag, and that is if uh, the, 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 the mainstream thinking in Nepal is that by leveraging the India-China relationship, they are going to have this connectivity and, uh, uh, and become uh, uh, a medium of India-China trade again, they might have to rethink that idea because today the state of Sikkim also connects India and China directly without Nepal. This has been a traditional trading route for centuries as well. So you might well have a situation where Nepal is entirely bypassed if India and China do reach an accommodation on, on, on trade issues. And therefore, I think the rethink is incumbent not just on the Indian side, but on the Nepali side as well. 
And I concluded with that in my paper. Right. Uh, we are almost out of time, but I'm, I want to take one last question that we have in the picture. Uh, this question uh, is about the Indo-Nepal Treaty and essentially asking that, you know, uh, uh, the Indo-Nepal Treaty of 1950, and Mr. Gokhale, I'll come to you also for this. The Indo-Nepal Treaty of 1950 seems, uh, remains unchanged uh, and, and in a way creates a framework for the relationship between the countries in the last 75 years. And essentially, as long as this treaty remains unchanged, can one really say that uh, Nepal's foreign policy has undergone a fundamental reorientation? All right. So this has become a, a, a very big concern. And uh, recently with the new book that, uh, you know, sort of uh, hints at how Bhutan has renegotiated its treaty with India and why cannot Nepal? Uh, the, well, we have been, and again, that's what I think. The 1950 treaty became the bone of contention because there seems to be a misunderstanding between what does the special relationship mean? I think the two countries need to sit down and find out because is it only that? Is it only economics? I don't think so. Is it? Is it? It, it is a lot to do with our culture, our history, our people to people ties. So there are a lot of things that goes into to that and negotiation boundary talks have been happening there was an epg report that has been submitted uh, there seems to be a halt of a diplomatic dialogue between the two countries honestly uh, which is very concerning because you know because without a diplomatic dialogue there's not going to be much solutions and the, the hardening of position post 2015 has happened because of the failure of diplomatic dialogue but that did not sort of you know happen or because the Nepali side felt that they were not their call to uh, negotiations were not being respected uh, now coming to uh, sir's point again Vijay sir's point again about you know how Nepal and uh, sorry how India and China might, uh, you know, come together and that might create a situation for Nepal. And that has already happened. Kalapani issue, it was brought up back in 2005 when India and China signed a border agreement. It came up in 2015 when they agreed to open uh, trade routes, uh, you know, and which both of them acknowledge. We sent protesting notes to both and then it came up again in 2019. So that situation, again, is something that the Nepali policymakers are going to keep an eye on. Now, again, I think I would just would like to emphasize about, uh, again, the Panchayat region and about the policy of neutrality, non-alignment. I think Nepal really holds a, you know, a special place in the world for contributing to the international system. Nepal's relationship with the British made Nepali soldiers contribute to the entire system that came into existence. And one of the great part of the non-alignment policy that Nepal pursued was neutrality between neighbors because of the sticky situation. Nepal would, I think, would continue with this policy of not wanting to get involved in the conflict of the neighbors. But I think there was this consciousness of the rule-based international order that Nepal wanted to be part of. And I think this is is where a lot of research is required from the Nepali side as to what, what creates our perception, what are the policies we have implemented, and how it has worked in our favor, it has not. And I think the, you know, the UN, we've always been part of the multilateral world. I think uh, the rule-based international order that Nepal has contributed is going to, I think that is going to be a third option uh, and a very influential factor actually for Nepal as it moves forward. Um, so right, I think uh, I would stop there. Okay, uh, Mr. Gokhale, last word from you. Uh, the treaty yeah. uh, is yeah. that, is this is this the is this the ideal starting point for India to figure out how to take forward its policy in the in the twenty first century? I think it could be a starting point, Deep, if the Nepali side is clear about what it wants through the negotiation. Uh, what I don't think will happen is that India will agree to everything that Nepal wants. And the, uh, Nepal will not agree to anything that India wants. I, uh, I think India has made it clear on more than one occasion that it's quite willing to review the treaty, but that all the issues on India-Nepal relations need to be put back on the table. Uh, now, uh, if the Nepali side gets clarity on what uh, it, it means uh, and what it wants, then I think a negotiation can begin. Uh, but of course, it will have to involve some accommodation of what India wants as well, because after all, this is a bilateral relationship. So that's certainly one way to go. Uh, I think another way to go is to, to try and resolve the thorny problem of the, the boundary. Uh, but whichever way it is, I think we need to build that trust. And the bottom, bottom line is that uh, uh, provided we can build that trust, I don't think problems between the two sides are intractable. 
Right. right. If I may just add the, yeah, yeah. I'm so Especially, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I just want to add one point. I think I missed that out. And uh, something that I was thinking about from yesterday's event was about this younger generation that's coming up in Nepal. And I grew up in a generation uh, where we were very linked to the Indian uh, culture, uh, Bollywood, and so on and so forth. And now I was wondering, like, you know, yeah, because what does the younger generation feel? Because uh, previously, a lot of people used to go to India to study. That has changed. You know, my siblings, all of them studied in India. I have studied in India because they were not good schools at that time. And I think that is also another very interesting dynamics that's going to play. That what, how has the younger generation uh, connected with the Indians? Like, let's say, after 2000, you know, I think the millennials, I think that would also be a very interesting takeaway. And again, like, you know, Nepal has never been in a position to renegotiate treaties, uh, given the political instability. So I think that is, again, going to be a very crucial factor for Nepal to, to even be able to, like, you know, sort of create a unified stand to renegotiate such an important treaty with such a close ally. So, right, so I just wanted to put that out there. Okay, right, thanks absolutely. so much. In fact, in fact that, that reminds me of, of this, uh, of this uh, friend of ours and, and a very uh, uh, well-known journalist in, in Nepal, Akhilesh Upadhyay, uh, writing about the India-Pakistan match on Twitter the day after uh, the match, even before any of the rest of us had anything, you know, had, had managed to put our thoughts together. He, he had things to say about, about the cricket match. Uh, we're absolutely out of time, but thank you very much, Mr. Gokhale, Tino, Apeksha. It was a it was an honor and a pleasure to have you with us. And our viewers, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, do uh, stay on with us uh, for more uh, installments of uh, India and the World. Uh, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.